Recently, I bought this 3134B Coco 2. This is the Coco 2 that has the T1 chip and it has lowercase capabilities. I've hooked it up to my Sony CRT TV over here and I've adjusted it so that, you know, we can video it a little bit better with my cell phone. So the picture quality is not going to be that great. Okay. We have the nice green screen. If you can see that, maybe you can't. Let me try and zoom in a little bit. All right, it has Color Basic 1.3. It does not have Extended Color Basic. So now, let's see the RAM. And we can see that it has 16K. So what I wanna do in this video is I wanna upgrade the RAM and I'm gonna upgrade it to 64K and what I want to do is add extended color basic as well. So I went ahead and I removed the cover. You don't want to see that. Everyone's seen that. And so this is what the inside of the Coco looks like. Um, I'm going to remove the keyboard. You can very carefully grab this ribbon cable from both sides and gently pull up on it while grabbing it or gripping it firmly so it slides out of the socket and just set it aside. Now let's go over the board here a little bit. So let me zoom in. Okay. So let's go over here first. All right, what you see there is the T1 chip. This is the T1 VDG. And the number on it is XC80652P. So this is indeed the lowercase version of the Coco 2. All right, over here we have the RAM. And if you see the number there, it is an MB81416-12. This back here, the dash 12, that's the speed of the RAM. What is important here is the 416 at the end. This the 16 says that it's 16 kilobytes and the four says that it's four bits wide. So this is why you need two of these to have 16 kilobytes that are eight bits wide. Over here, you have the SAM chip, which is uh, has a part number that is slightly different than the one that every other Coco 2 has, or at least the ones that I'm used to and that I grew up with, or the one that I grew up with. This is the SN74LS785N. The other one is the SN74LS783N. This is the ROM. We'll be upgrading this later. Over here, you have a 6809, that's the CPU. And then over here you have a 6821 and the SC SC67331P. So these are are both <clears throat> essentially the same. They're slightly different, but you can actually replace this one with a 6821 and it will work the same. Now, um, to upgrade the RAM, which is the first thing we're going to do, right? We're going to pull these. So I have my trusty chip puller here. Get that in there. Put the guy aside. And pull those. Okay. Next, there's a jumper on the board that you have to jumper. Um, so you can tell the Coco that you've upgraded the RAM to 64K. That jumper is this one right here. Now I've gone ahead and I've taken a piece of wire and I've pre-tinned it so that all we gotta do is solder it on there. Now I will try my best to solder it on there while looking at this video, but I think it's gonna be difficult because I have very big hands. <laughs> 
Let's see. Did we? Yes, we got one there. Let me get some more solder on this tip here. And I moved that out of the way because of course I did. And there we go. It is soldered on there. Now, you can be neater about it and you can clean out these two uh, holes here and you can put the wire through, but there really isn't a need to do that. There really is no need. Next, take your stip, your snips, and you just cut right there. And there you have a closed jumper. Now, the ram that I'm going to add is a ram board that I made. And it's actually static ram. And the Coco doesn't care, you know. And it's this board right here, which I have another video talking about this board. And so this board um, on the silk screen tells you how it's oriented. And so there's an arrow pointing to the back of the Coco. And then there's another arrow that points towards cart. So if you do end up installing one of these, make sure that you get the orientation correct. So it should just be a matter of popping that into that expansion port. And that's it. Now let's see if the Coco recognizes that it has more RAM. Here's the Coco. I've reinstalled the keyboard. I've plugged it into the mains and I've hooked up the RF can. Uh, to the TV. Now I've adjusted the lighting a little bit so it's a little dark so that I can record the image on the CRT. Okay. So let's turn it on. Okay, we get Color Basic 1.3. That's a good sign. That means it at least accepted some RAM. All right, and let's see what it reports. Okay. It reports 32K of RAM. Now, hmm, we installed 64K. Why is it reporting 32K of RAM? Well, it turns out that's just what it does. Um, and there isn't really a super straightforward way of you know, checking to see if uh, the other 32K is available, but there are ways of doing it. You can use programs that access the upper 32K, and if they run, then you know that the 32K, the extra 32K, or rather the 64K was installed and the Coco recognizes it successfully. Um, there are one or two programs out there. And then there's a method that copies um, the ROM to RAM and uh, the upper parts of RAM. And then um, you can, and if it works, that means that obviously that the Coco can see the full 64K of RAM. So later on, after upgrading to Extended Color Basic, I'll go ahead and try one or two of those methods uh, to make sure to confirm that uh, we do have 64K installed. Now we're going to upgrade the ROM. Upgrading the ROM uh, is a multi-step process. So the first thing you have to do is move these jumpers that you see here that go across where it says here 64 kilobits or 8k and move them across between this point and this point so they can be across the 128 kilobits or 16k or kilobytes rather so we got to do it to these four jumpers and we have to do it to this one so what i am going to attempt to do first well first i'm going to remove the rom let's do that Okay, and that uh, clears up space for us. Next, what I want to do is I'm going to add some flux around here and pull the jumpers out. And then I'm going to clean up these holes a little bit so we can just place the jumpers back in. So let's see if we can do that. Oops, too much. I was pretty generous with the flux there. All right, let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, so uh, I really can't see what I'm doing. OK, 
Okay, okay. Okay, there goes one. Put it over there. There goes two. And this there goes three. And I'm having a hard time seeing this, but I think it's hot enough now. No, it's not. There we go. It's moving now. There goes that one. And then there's one more. And that one. So now let's try and suck some of that up with some braid. Okay. And so sometimes there isn't really enough solder to suck it up so you have to add some. And let's add some. That helps sometimes. It's kind of weird, but it is something that is done. Oh, of course, let's add some more flux. Okay, and you can see how it's sucking it right up. And that cleared up quite a bit. And that was not as good as I thought it would be. It's okay. And I may have to stop this and do it without my phone in the way because I really can't see what I'm doing. Okay, well we'll come back to that one later. Let's look at these over here. And let's add some solder. Okay, and <clears throat> let's snip this braid off and start the process over. So, where were we? Okay, I think, I can't really see. Actually, you know what helps sometimes? If you add flux to the braid itself, that does help. Yeah. Doesn't look too bad. So a little bit more flux here. This is not going well. Oh 
Well, looks like we got one cleaned up. Okay, well, as you can see, that was not great. So I'm gonna have to stop this and investigate a little further by moving this out of the way and so I can have some more room. So, well, okay, I'll so back. it turns out it was not as bad as I thought it was. I just couldn't tell uh, through what I was seeing on my phone here. So I actually did clean him out, it was pretty good. So now I'm going to put them in, put the jumpers back in, in uh, the other position now. They may not go in perfectly, but they're going good enough. There's still some flux in there. I might have to heat them up a little bit to push them in, but that's not a big deal. We will do that right now. So and there we go. That looks like it's right where I want it to be. Put some flux there. Beautiful. Let's go to the next one. Okay. And these are going to be over here. And let's put this guy in. No, my eyes are just not what they used to be. Now they're in my hands. Okay. And same sort of thing. Let's heat it up a little bit. Push it down. Oops. That's some flux there. That might help push it down. There we go. And add some there. Plenty. Next. Same deal. I'm going to push it down. Get it up so it can go down. I think. And that's good enough. Okay, next. Mirror jumper. These things are so small, my fingers are so fat that I really have a hard time grabbing onto them. I don't know. Get in there. And they're a little tweaked. Because when I pulled them out, they bent a little bit, so that's why. They're not going in straight. Okay. And then the next one. And of course. The last one goes in easily. Well, that one actually I had to make because I lost one of them. So maybe that's why it went in a little easier. There's no solder on it. It's a little thinner, it looks like. It looks cleaner. Okay, so now these guys are in. We have one, two, three, four, five, and they are in the 128 kilobit position. Um, looks pretty good. It's a little dirty. It's a little fluxy. So I'm gonna add some flux remover just to clean it up before doing anything else. And I only want to clean it up just a little bit. 
Those are actually a lot. Because this stuff is sticky. If it's on there for too long, it can't ruin the board. I mean, it's, it'll take years and years and years and years, but I mean, why not? Yeah, the board's open. Let's go ahead and clean some of this up. Um, I mean, for what we're doing, this is probably good enough. Okay, I'll check it out some more later. It's hard for me to see right now while recording, but yeah, if you're interested to see um, what I'm using to clean, I'm using this flux remover. I like it, works well. It's not the cheapest, but it works. Okay, now it's time to program the ROM. Um, there are many EEPROM programmers. Um, I'm going to use the TL8662 Plus. It's a very inexpensive one. It's available everywhere. Only downside in my case is that the software is a Windows only program. But I am running it under Linux uh, using Wine. And uh, with a modification to one of the um, dynamic libraries, it works just fine. It does look a little funky, but I am okay with that as long as I can run it on Linux. So if you have uh, this 27C128 or similar you know, ROM chip, uh, then you're good. You just load the ROM images um, like you normally would and it'll program just fine. However, these are getting harder to find. And so what I was able to find, uh, thanks to a friend on the Coco Discord server, uh, was this chip. This is the SST27S512. So you can see from the, the part number here that this is a 512 kilobit version of, uh, of an EEPROM. And so that's four times as much data as this chip on the left has. And so that means you're gonna have two extra address lines. And you see them here, A14 and A15. Um, on the Coco, uh, pin one is actually left floating. There's, it's not anywhere, but we're gonna have to take care of that. We're gonna have to either ground it or uh, raise it to five volts. And uh, pin 27 is doing something on the Coco. Um, and here it's one of the address lines. So we're gonna have to fix it as well. You know, if it isn't already fixed, which it is, uh, to either five volts or ground. So um, we can just look at the schematic for this Coco, which, you know, there isn't a schematic, uh, or at least there wasn't, but I was able to make one uh, by reverse engineering one of these things. Well, I don't know about reverse engineering, but at least taking the time to make a schematic from a board. And I've published it online and I'll put the link down in the description. But as I, um, make these cocoa motherboards this is where i would include i will include them and so let's scroll down to this model we're looking at the 26-31 3xb the x uh, stands for either four or six ours is a four so we just have to click on that okay now you can go ahead and you can download um, the whole repository and you'll have the KiCad files and then you can open it just like you normally would any other KiCad uh, project and look at the schematic that way and the board and all that. However, I have included it here in PDF form. So if you just want to look at the schematic as a PDF, you can either download it from here or you can just click here where it says schematic and view it online. We'll just wait here a second while it loads and the different sheets are here. Now we're going to go down to uh, the ROM sheet because that's what we are interested in. Here's the ROM sheet. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it a little better. Okay, so now let's look at the two pins that we are interested in. First one was pin one. Uh, like I said before, it's floating. You see it's not connected here. And there's a jumper that you see here on the schematic so you can ground the pin one. This jumper does not exist 
on the board. I made a note here, I added it. So you can either leave it floating like it was originally on the board, or if you want to use a 256 kilobit uh, EEPROM. So this doesn't exist. So this is just floating. However, pin 27 is, is there and it's being used, or rather it's being set to high, it's at five volts. So we're gonna to have to do something about that. So we can program this um, assuming that pin one is either high or low and that 27 is high. Let's look at uh, the actual chip and see what's easier to get at. Is it easier to get to ground or is it easier to get to five volts? Well, if we look at the chip here, uh, pin one is close to pin 28. So that's a, a straight shot across here. So with a very short jumper, we can set it high to five volts. Whereas if we want to go to ground, we've got to come out with a slightly longer jumper and go around some stuff to get down to 14. Now there may be other points on the board with ground, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this is easy. So let's let's just set A15 high and, let's, and just keep A14 as high. So one and 27 high, okay. So what is that going to look like uh, in terms of programming this? Well, let's take a quick look here. Let's open up a text editor. And so we have uh, starting, we have 16 pins or 16 address lines starting at A15 and going down all the way to A0. Okay. And so um, we said A15, we're going to say it's high. We're going to use that as a one. We're going to represent that as a one, right? A14 is also high, that's another one. And then everything else is zero. Okay, so now we have 16 bits here representing the address lines. So the base at this 1100 here, or 1100 is actually a C in hexadecimal, and then the other ones are zero. All right, so our base address is going to be C000. That's where we're going to load uh, the extended color basic. Uh, color basic, so extended color basic will be there as C00. Color basic is going to be um, 2000 hex away. So C000 hex plus 2000 hex uh, is uh, E. Okay. So we're going to load extended color basic here and we're going to learn uh, load color basic here. Okay. So at this point we can open up uh, the programmer. Okay. Like I said, it looks a little funky on mine cause uh, I'm running it on the wine, but I'm okay with that. I've already selected the chip 512 here, SST 27 S 512. Right. And so now let's actually load. Um, first we're going to load color extended color basic. Okay, so we're going to load it. I have it um, in my R directory here. And so I have it right here, extended basic. We'll load that. Now here is where we tell it where to load it in the chip. So where did we say we want an extended color basic? In C000. Okay, and we're going to clear the buffer. All right, and we'll confirm that it's down there. And there we see garbage. It's all geeky. All right, next we're gonna learn, we're gonna load, oops, sorry, color basic or the basic ROM, okay? Now, where do we want this? We want color basic at E, triple zero, all right? But we don't wanna clear the buffer, we wanna keep extended color basic that we just loaded there. So we're going to disable this. Okay. We hit okay. Okay. And we can go down and confirm. We'll go to E000. Uh, oops, that's a little bit too far. And you can see that it's there. Okay. So extended color basic ends around here and color basic starts around here. Okay. Now I'm going to place the chip in my programmer. All right. And 
I know it fails because I've already programmed it so that I would, if you're using this, I would uh, untick check ID and then we just program it. Okay, that was a success. And so now let's actually plug it into the Coco and see what happens. Here's the chip and I'm gonna plug it into the Coco. Now keep in mind, this divot here is the top of the chip, All right? This is pin one, this is pin 28. On the Coco, for whatever reason, on this Coco model, uh, these two chips here are in the opposite orientation of every other chip. So when you're plugging it back in, keep in mind that you're gonna to have to rotate it relative to the other chips. So this points down. So let's plug it in. Okay. And since I've uh, prepped a little bit for the video, I've already uh, strained out the legs here uh, so that it goes in nicely. But if you're using a new one, remember you gotta strain them out uh, so you can actually pop it in. Now I'm gonna turn it on and it's gonna fail. It's not gonna work. And so let's look here. Well, I stand corrected. That was lucky. It may not always work. Like there. I just hit the reset and it failed. Why did it fail? Well, because remember, uh, pin one is floating. And so pin one, which is this one over here, is it can be high, it can be low. Um, in our case, it was high when we first started, and then it went low after I hit a reset. And here it's high again. But there's no guarantee that it's going to be high on the next one. And look, now we have a black screen. So it's in an indeterminate state. You can't count on it. So what do we do? Well, what we said we were going to do, we were going to bring it high. And I'm gonna jumper it real fast out here. So we said that this was high, pin 28, that's five volts, right? Oops. And so we're gonna bring five volts to pin one. Okay. And so that jumper there will do the trick. And there we go. We have a nice green screen. And I can reset it. And it's always gonna know how to start because it's a known state now. Um, let's see. I guess um, I can put in a cartridge and see how that turns on. So I decided to use the Coco SEC instead of Megabug for this part of the test. Uh, because uh, the Coco SEC will not run without Extended Color Basic. And since we've freshly flashed Extended Color Basic in here, this is the test we need. So, plugged in. Let's go over. Sure enough, it starts up. Good times. Now, a way to test um, that we do have 64K of RAM installed is to run a program that requires it. Donut Dilemma happens to be one of those programs. And so if Donut Dilemma does not run, that means the Coco is not accessing the 64K or the extra RAM that we installed. So I will do that now. Let me turn this off, put in a keyboard and try it. Here we are with the Coco and keyboard installed. All right, Coco SDC is plugged in. Donut Dilemma is ready to load. Okay, color computer one and two with PAL autofracting, no. We want number two. Here we go. We do want to practice game. And Grangelo has struck again. Okay, so far so good. The game seems to be running. Um, I'm not gonna play because I only have one hand available. But this proves that the Coco is accessing 
all the 64K. So good times, good times. So the next step here is to actually solder a jumper on the bottom side of the board so that the EEPROM always has five volts on it, on pin one. All right, here's the bottom of the board. I didn't want to take this thing off completely because it's a pain to take those little uh, fasteners off. So I've just taken it off enough to, you know, peel it back a little bit. So here's the bottom of the ROM of the EEPROM chip. And I'm going to solder these two forward points. And so let's do this. I think I can do this. Will they come out? Yes, it will. <laughs> now I can only see in there. All right, first thing you want to do is you want to tin uh, these two points here, which holy moly, I cannot see what the heck I'm doing. Okay, and of course I tinned the wrong ones. Next, we use the jumper that I've pre-cut already. And I hope I can see what I am doing here. Okay, yes I can. Okay, and then we're gonna go over Oh, I gotta push a little bit further. And, oh, that's gonna be a disaster. All right. It's okay if it touches uh, that point over there, they're on the same trace. And move that over a little bit. And then I'll already do this one on this side. And there we go. Go ahead, put some tape over it, maybe not this type of tape, but something just to insulate it a little bit. And that's it. I'm going to put it back together and test it out. All right, I've assembled it again, and now the moment of truth. Ta-da, it worked. Now let's reset it just to make sure. Perfect. And so now I'm going to go ahead and put the cover back on and actually, you know what, before that, I want to try something. I want to see if I can, um, yeah, I'm going to hook up the RGB to HDMI adapter. And so we can, you know, see it on both screens. Let me try that. Okay. Okay. So I put in my HDMI adapter board, or rather RGB to HDMI. I've gone ahead and soldered, um, what would have been uh, the RGB bypass on here so that we can get output on the RF can. Usually those are unsoldered so that you can bypass the capacitor on the board without having to cut it off. And because that capacitor now is in the circuit again, um, uh, you're going to see some sparklies here on the screen. So it's not a big deal. Usually you don't have the sparklies, but for this video, there are going to be sparklies. So let's turn on the cocoa. So we can compare them. Okay. It's pretty close. The colors are pretty close. Obviously this looks a little bit more vivid over here. Um, actually it looks vivid in, in person here, but in the video, it's kind of like washed out a little bit. Um, cause I can't lower the brightness like I did on this one. But as you can see, it's, it's looking really good compared to the RF out. I'm going to start off. Okay, we're gonna do number two. It's pretty clean, it looks very good. The colors are not exactly the same, but they're very close. It's good enough. So let's uh Press the any key here and let's play a practice game. All right, cool.
No, I can't see what I'm doing. There we go. And there you have it. This Coco has been upgraded and it works and it's great. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna remove the adapter so that I can assemble it again, but I consider this done. Very good.